Hi, welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Lisa Martin, and we are on the ground at Google in Mountain View, California with the CloudNow organization. It, tonight is their fifth annual Top Women in Cloud Innovation Award event, and we're so excited to be here with one of the award winners tonight, Tara Hernandez. Tara, welcome to theCUBE. Hi. It's great to have you here. Tara, talk to us about um, what you're doing here at the CloudNow event tonight. Uh, what's the, the big driver for you to be here? And talk to us about what this award means to you. Uh, well, first of all, it was a complete shock when I found out about it. it um, I got an email from the organizer saying I had been nominated um, from someone I had done an interview with many years ago. Um, and so it was, it was very startling. Uh, and then I looked in more to the organization and was like, wow, this is really cool. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of cloud as a technology. I think it's un unbelievably enabling for a variety of reasons. And so it's very exciting to be part of an organization now where we're using cloud as a, as a means to advance women in technology. Fantastic. Talk to us about the project for which you were nominated and how is that really, how are you seeing that help advance not just your own career, but those of colleagues of yours? Um, well, I was nominated for two reasons. Um, one, I'm um, for a long time, uh, I've been involved with continuous delivery and integration uh, and deployment, uh, infrastructure engineering as, as a general rule. Um, and my interview was, was based around that. Uh, and so it's, uh, I've done a lot of open, open source advocacy. Um, the cloud really uh, has uh, advanced open source in a lot of ways because the cost of entry to sp you know, spending a few bucks in AWS versus having to go down to Fry's and, and maxing out your credit card to buy a server, <laughs> there's a big difference there, right? right? right. Um, and then combined with, um, you know, I've, I've been very blessed in my career with a lot of great support and mentors. Um, and I feel like I need to get back to the, to the industry and I've done a lot of um, advocacy in the last couple of years for women and technology in particular. Um, and the same thing, you know, if you're coming out of school or a boot camp um, and you need um, some servers to work on your projects or you want to do some, you know, developing some entrepreneurial opportunities, there's, you know, you can spend a few bucks in AWS and get a lot farther on your own without having to go through, you know, a lot of cost expenditure or having to go through the VCs before you're ready, any of that stuff. So the barrier of entry gets lower, which means more people, including women, have an opportunity to get started. Speaking of barriers, you know, we're all familiar with the statistics of only a quarter of the tech industry is made up of women. Only 16% in, in, uh, in technical roles. I actually had to look that up not too long ago. Okay, interesting, that's very interesting, which is quite low. I'd love to understand, you know, yes, there are barriers, there's, um, you mentioned VCs. It's extremely challenging for female CEOs to not just get funding from a VC, but to even get a meeting with VCs. So we, we understand some of those obvious barriers, but one of the things I'd love to understand is your career path, how did you get to be an award winner today? Where did you start? Were you a, as a kid, this is what I want to do, I love computer science, or did you take maybe a more non-linear path? Oh, heck no. Uh, when I went to college, I was fully intending to be a double major in history and English literature. Wow. Uh, yeah, I had no interest in the sciences, and uh, my parents said, uh, we want you to get a job when you graduate, and to them that meant a math or a science degree. Um, uh, my alma mater, UC Santa Cruz, so go slugs. Um, they had what they called at the time the open access computing uh, model. Um, anybody who wanted an email account could get one, which was unusual at the time. Yeah. Uh, I met a whole bunch of other people who also had email accounts, and when I went to figure out, do I want, what do I want to do for a major, I'm like, well, I'll do computer science, because I've met some people, and they're nice. That is literally how I got into computers. Wow, interesting. I had so no other background. Did you just fall in love with it immediately? Was no. there some, okay, so I talk to us about that path, <laughs> and how did you, who were your influences, both female influences, male influences, when you were at UCSC? Um, so I, I really struggled. I didn't have the background. I, I felt that I was you know, always going to be behind all of my classmates who clearly had done more leading up into the program. Um, I had um, a, a couple of professors in particular that were really supportive. One was Daryl Long. They're still there. Daryl Long um, It was one. Um, and, uh, and he was very famous for if you fell asleep in his class, he was unerring in his ability to get chalk in your mouth. Wow. Um, yeah, he, it, was, it was great for that. <laughs> and, uh, and then the other one who was really inspirational to me was Professor Tracy Larrabee. Um, I went to her office hours so many times just ready to quit and she just simply would not let me. Um, and so I started to get better about figuring out, uh, like, you know, don't have to study by yourself. You know, get a study buddy, work in project teams, collaboration, and that really led me into a lot of great success in my career because I realized you can't do it by yourself. And, uh, and let's just face it, you know, women do better in groups, I think, uh, on average. And that's really interesting that you had this nonlinear path, which I think is such an important 
topic for girls, whether they're pursuing STEM at, in middle school or high school or not, to understand that you don't have to have everything figured out. You mentioned a couple of mentors, male and female, who still probably, you probably still hear their voices you know, in the back of your head. Oh heck, I still exchange emails and oh, Facebook messages with fantastic. a lot of them. It's and I'm sure they're very proud of you for this award tonight. You mentioned advocacy is very important to you. Talk to us about what you're doing for advocacy for women in technology, maybe other minority groups? So I'm primarily uh, related to uh, Women Who Code, which is a 5013C uh, headed by Elena Percival, who's this amazing powerhouse of a woman. Um, I've also uh, done some work with Chick Tech, um, which is a, uh, targeted at getting uh, high school age girls and maybe middle school too um, engaged in STEM curriculum. Um, I also have been um, doing some work and I hope to expand more with an organization called Code 2040, um, which is aiming at uh, Latino and African American students and getting them into high tech. Um, so it's, you know, I'm try to be very uh, uh, open-minded about who I talk to uh, and look for opportunities in a variety of ways. Uh, my current boss and company, Linden Lab, have been really supportive. We've had conversations about um, you know, unconscious bias, interviewing and job descriptions and other things that make, make that process uh, more likely to include more diverse candidates and, and hires. Um, you know, th there's been ho whole discussions around uh, uh, just language you know, and the type of products that we have also lend itself to that. We are trying to be a product that anybody can use, literally, and, and so the more diverse our company is, the more diverse we feel we'll be able to reach out to those consumers. Speaking of your product, can you tell us a little bit more about it and how you are leveraging it to expand diversity? Um, so, uh, Linden Lab uh, is primarily known for a product called Second Life, which is a virtual reality platform. It's been around for a really long time. Um, we have a, a new product that's going to be coming out uh, next year called Project Sansar. Um, and what it is, is a place for anybody to go do whatever they want to do virtually. Um, and we, we try to support that creativity with monetization. So if you're an artist, you could create you know, a new building or artwork or clothing or a, a, an avatar um, and you can sell it and make some money off of it. Um, and there are people who do quite lucrative things in there. We hope to replicate that uh, in Sansar. The biggest difference with Sansar, of course, is it's more modern graphics system. There's a heavy emphasis, emphasis in virtual reality. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that Second Life uh, and Sansar will allow you to be whoever you want to be. You, you, whoever you are in the real world has nothing to do with who you choose to be in a virtual platform. And I've heard some very powerful stories about people who realized that they were gay or trans, or there was some belief that they really had no way of expressing and they met other people like them and it really gave them a, a very powerful community to get strength from. Um, there's downsides as well. You, you can take that same opportunity. There was, uh, in this last election, there were Trump supporters and Bernie Sanders supporters in Second Life having full-on warfare. Wow. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, I was like, wow, who, who, thought, who knew? Um, so yeah, but it's, it's kind of like real world, but better. So in terms of kind of like next steps here, um, you talked about the project that you're working on. Uh, we want to congratulate you again on being one of the top women recognized by CloudNow for your achievements in cloud technology. We wish you the very best of luck in, in the future in your career and as being an influencer <laughs> to other girls in tech. We thank you so much for joining theCUBE. Thanks very much. Thank you for watching theCUBE. I'm your host, Lisa Martin, at Google headquarters with CloudNow's event. We'll be right back.